A great verse about giving to the work of the Lord is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 7. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 7. I want to talk to you just a little bit on a Bible study that I entitled Incentivized to Give. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9, they, uh, they talk a lot about giving in the cause of Christ. Now, the 2 Corinthian letter is divided into three parts. Uh, the first seven chapters have to do with the church itself and the problems that they were facing. They had some problems in their congregation. And those first seven chapters are dedicated to dealing with those problems. Then chapter 8 and 9, it's about the offerings. And then uh, the 10th chapter through the rest is all about the apostolic ministry. Well, uh, let's get into the Bible study. Incentivized to Give is the title. Number one, Paul had given this church a written giving plan. It was in writing. It was in the first letter <laughs> to the Corinthian church. Uh, now concerning the collection, as I've given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Paul had already given this church a written giving plan. They were to give systematically. Did you notice that? Paul says in uh, meeting the great need of the work of God, you should give systematically, not spasmodically. No, as a regular routine, routine to give purposely, on purpose giving, routine giving. We ought to decide, uh, this is what I'm going to do, and week after week after week, I'm going to give as God has blessed me. And this offering, I'm dedicating to God every single week. That's what Paul admonished them to do. So they were told to have a routine of giving, a systematic way of giving. So many Christians don't do that. They, uh, they don't do things routinely. You should have a routine of reading the Bible. Really? Yes. Every single day you ought to read the Bible. You should have a routine of prayer. Every single day that a person's alive, they ought to spend their day in prayer with God. Praying every day. Reading the Bible every day. Witnessing every day. Going to church when we have church services. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. The revival meetings. All these things. Go to church. Forsake not the assembling. It should be your routine to be in church. It also should be part of my and your routine that we give in the great cause of Jesus Christ. So they're to give systematically. Now, how did the Corinthian people uh, respond to that? Oh, in 1 Corinthians, they were eager. Yes, we want to do that. There's a big problem. According to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, in chapter 9, the Corinthian believers had failed. They had said, oh, we want to do it. But they had failed. Nothing had transpired. They had not kept uh, their promise. They had failed to implement the plan. They had a written plan from Paul to give systematically, give on the first day of the week, on Sunday, uh, give routinely, not spasmodically, uh, they were, and they agreed to it, said, yes, that's what we'll do. But they didn't do it. Actions speak louder than words. How many Christians have promised to do things and then not done it? I'm going to go and witness to all my neighbors, we say, and then we don't do it. I'm going to let all my coworkers know this week that I'm a Christian, and then we don't do it. Those would be wonderful things for all of our neighbors and all of our co-workers to know that we are saved and we want them to be saved. We should be doing that, don't you think? Well, of course. And so often we, uh, we make promises um, that we're going to do things and we fail to do it. And this uh, church in Corinth, these Corinthian Christians, 
Oh, they've made good plans, but they fail to pursue the plan. You can make the best plan there is, but if you don't implement the plan, nothing really happens. So Paul gave them a written plan. They agreed to it, but they failed. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9, Paul appeals to them to renew their commitments. Now you said you were going to do it, but you failed, church. Now let's get it caught up. Let's get involved with it. And he gives them an example. He talks to them about the Macedonians. If you read 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9, you'll find that Paul says, I want you to listen about these Macedonians. The Macedonians were uh, a people group that was quite small. They were poor. They had been ravaged by war. Uh, and, and just uh, many things uh, that were against them. But the Macedonians, oh, it seemed like the poorer they became, it seems like the poorer they became, the more they gave. In fact, he makes this astounding statement that beyond their power, they gave. They gave to their power and beyond their power. How can you give beyond your power? The only way I can understand that is God got involved with those Macedonians. When the Macedonians began to implement their giving plan and started participating in it, somehow God says, I'm going to help you. You're going to be able to give even more than you dreamed. Oh, uh, do your giving while you're living so you're knowing where it's going. These Macedonians, they're knowing where it's going in the work of God. And God said, I'm so pleased and so happy. I'm going to help you give even beyond uh, your ability. I am going to help you give. That's astounding, is it not? I think Paul was uh, pretty astounded by that, those Macedonians. No, you can't give. You can't give. You're very poor. All oh, the Macedonians said, we must give. We absolutely see this as our obligation to the Lord. It is a holy consecration, uh, a holy commitment we're making. And uh, now, now, some people say, now, pastor, you're just asking for too many offerings around this church. Pastor, you're taking up special collections for buildings and, and uh, you want to buy a new church bus. And uh, Oh, pastor, you want to kill the church. Pastor, you're going to kill the church with all this giving. Oh, friends, come on. There's never been a pastor who has killed the church by taking too many offerings. I reject that. Actually, most of the time, how the churches have died is because we quit taking collections. We, we quit doing the plan. There's churches that are dying. Oh, maybe what we need to do is just take some more offerings. You can't outgive God. Oh, uh, number three, we come to Paul's admonishment for them to give uh, responsibly. Let me read to you verses 13 and 14 of chapter 8. I mean not that other men be eased and ye burdened, but by an equality that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want, that their abundance also may be a supply for your want, that there may, may be an equality. What's he saying? He's saying, now look, everybody get involved with this given program. No one's excused. Everyone give as God has given you increase. You participate and um, be responsible. Every one of you church men, get in it. All of you fine ladies, get in it. Every family unit, let's get involved in the giving to the work of God. You know, if, um, if you happen to carry a great big log, you just cut down this big tree. Just cut down this big tree. And it's a big tree. And you got to carry that thing out of the out of the forest, and you've got one man right there in the middle, and ooh, he's got the big load on him. And then you got some other fella walking alongside him. He's not even touching the tree. Well, man, why don't you help pick part of that up? Why don't you put your hand to the plow, and why don't somebody get on that other end, and somebody get on this back end, and everybody help carry that tree out there? Don't just let one man try to carry that tree out. 
Let's all get involved in carrying the, the great big tree out. Many hands make light work. That's what my mama too used to say. And it's true. When it comes to this matter of giving, every member of the, of the body of Christ, every one of us get involved and do our part. Oh yes, it's a, it's a wonderful thing to get to give in the cause of Christ. Now, there's an incentive promise from God in this. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall also reap sparingly. And he that soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Do you want God to bless you and your family? Do you want God, God to bless your church? Well, I'll tell you something. God blesses givers and abundantly blesses givers. I heard about this one businessman. Um, his pastor had come by and the businessman said, hey, um, to one of his workers said, hey, write, write the church a check. Write the church, church a check right now. And so they were in the process of writing a, a check to the church and word came that some of the supplies for that company had been destroyed. A large portion of their warehouse had been destroyed. And they said, should we write the check, uh, Mr. Bossman? He goes, absolutely. Let's, let's still give while we have something to give. Let that sink in. I'm glad the businessman who believed he had been led of God to write a check, that he continued with the writing of the check. I really don't know the end of that story, but I know God. I believe God blessed that man. That businessman who, who just kept giving. Now, we need to have a proper attitude toward everybody. In this passage, it says, Every man as he purposeth in his heart. I, I don't want the preacher to have to get up there and, and um, just squeeze on us at all times. No, every man in the congregation ought to be saying, I want to do part. I want to have part of this offering. Pastor, may I give the first offering in this? Just the other day, I was with Dr. David Gibbs, and there's a sudden need inside of the room where we were. I said to Dr. Gibbs, I said, Let, let's, let's raise some money right now. Dr. Gibbs says, I'll give the first $100. I said, I'll give the second $100. And other men in there, they began to give, and a spontaneous offering was received. Oh, yeah, some of these are spontaneous opportunities. Oh, yeah, let's all get involved. I know our church, Calvary Baptist Church, we've uh, helped plant other churches. And it's been expensive. Uh, we, uh, we give, not just money. Oh, some of the easiest giving is giving money. We've given some of our very best people, very best people to go and plant these churches. Oh, yeah, all of us need to be givers. Now, my last little thought for you, the example of Jesus Christ. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9, You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, and ye through his poverty might be rich. Who was the greatest giver? Jesus Christ. No one has ever outgiven Jesus. Friends, he gave his life. He left heaven to be born on this earth. He humbled himself and, and came to this earth. He lived among men. He never sinned. And then he went to a cross. And all of our sin was placed upon him. He wasn't dying for his sin. He was dying for our sins. He gave his life for us. No one's more qualified to talk about giving than Jesus. One of my preacher friends... I was at his church. He made this comment. They was about to take the offering up. He said, friends, church members, I determined a long time ago that I was going to be a giver and not a taker. That should be all of our attitudes, that we would be givers, not takers. Don't you want to give in the cause of Christ? Don't you want to be a cheerful giver? I heard one preacher say it this way. He said, well, we're about to take up the offering now. And God loveth the cheerful giver, but I suppose he'd take it from a grouch. And that's funny, I suppose. But we shouldn't be grouchy about getting to give. 
Think about it that way. We get to give. That's amazing that we get to partner with God in spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ around this world. Oh, yeah. Don't miss an opportunity today and this week. And sit down, sit down and make some plans about your giving. You know, I talk a lot about investing. Well, the greatest investment there is is investing in the work of God. Oh, yes. Dear Christian businessmen, oh, give, give. Yeah, don't give till it hurts. Give till it helps. And little man who has a common, ordinary job, oh, bless your heart. Most of the giving seems like comes from just common, ordinary men who get out of bed and they go to work and they serve their family. Most of them, their name's never known. And they put their tithe in and they put their offerings in at their local church. Oh, and God blesses a man like that. Blesses that man's family. Blesses that man's church. Oh, yeah. Let's all get involved. Now, I hear the comment, give your heart to Jesus. Well, I just had an old, dirty heart, sinful heart. Well, I'll tell you what, I called on Jesus and he saved me. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you're not saved, would you not call out to the Lord to be saved today? Then all of us Christians, now let's get involved with God's great work by giving in the cause of Christ. Because the Bible says he loves a cheerful giver. May God bless.